Out with the old and in with the new, Iran's president says farewell after eight years in power, leaving behind a complicated legacy. Supporters say they love him for standing up to the West. Opponents say he's left the country isolated. Will Iran's new president usher in the start of a new era, or is he likely to bring more of the same? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazm Sikha. Well, after eight years, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is leaving office. Iran's new president, Hassan Rouhani, will be inaugurated on Sunday in Tehran. On Friday, Ahmadinejad gave his last speech as president, addressing thousands of supporters in the capital. He told them he was grateful to have served them. May God make the poor rich and free prisoners and give justice and protect our leader. I want to take this opportunity to thank the nation of Iran and the people of Tehran who have taken to the streets and once again emphasized their values, their divine values. Best of luck to everyone. Well, let's bring in our guests then. In Tehran, we're joined by Ghan Barnaderi, a journalist for state-run Kehan International newspaper. And from Tel Aviv, we have Mayor Javin Danfar. He's an Iranian-Israeli analyst, co-author of The Nuclear Sphinx of Tehran. We'll hear from both of them in a moment. But first, Soraya Lenny reports from Tehran on the ups and downs of the past eight years. Iran's most controversial president came from the most uncontroversial beginnings. A blacksmith's son and a war veteran who became Iran's sixth president and a populist who became a pariah. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad leaves a country under pressure, both domestic and foreign. Analysts call his foreign policy approach antagonistic. Well, his foreign policy, as I indicated at the beginning, was on a uh, offensive approach rather than defensive one. And uh, also, instead of trying to solve problems with the Western power, and he declared uh, we should uh, get the support of Eastern power as well. His speeches were often fiery and inflammatory. Just in the same way as the Soviet Union disappeared and does not exist in today's world, very soon the Zionist regime will also disappear and mankind will be free. He failed to solve the nuclear dispute. Two of Iran's negotiators quit and there's been no breakthrough in a decade. Instead, Iran is under the toughest international sanctions in history. But his stance struck a chord with the Arab street, Africa and on America's doorstep. I'm sure this wave of revolution that covers all of Latin America will continue until it eradicates all the roots of imperialism. Ahmadinejad's administration opened more foreign embassies than any previous government. Domestically, he focused on improving the lives of the poor and removing subsidies that drained $100 billion a year from the government's budget but in part devalued Iran's currency by more than 70 percent in two years, creating higher inflation and unemployment. The president was almost impeached, and under his watch a $2.6 billion embezzlement case embroiled seven banks and his closest advisor. His cabinet too was pushed to the brink of collapse, and his relationship with the supreme leader suffered. But millions of Iranians will remember Ahmadinejad for the events of 2009. He won a second term under opposition claims of vote rigging and killings of protesters and mass arrests. But even after he leaves office, Ahmadinejad is not going very far. He still has to face court for his conduct in parliament and has even indicated he might run for president in four years. So only time will tell if this populist becomes popular once again. Soraya Leni, Al Jazeera, Tehran. Well, let's talk about Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, first then, and uh, Ghanbar Naderi in Tehran. Let me start with you. What, what do you think should uh, Ahmadinejad's uh, legacy be then? Well, uh, domestically speaking, he helped a lot of 
low-income families in the country by, in, by the introduction of the state subsidy reform plan a couple of years ago. So he has a lot of supporters in rural areas and among the low-income households. But for the uh, middle-class families in, in places like Tehran, he doesn't have a lot of backing and support for the simple fact that some of his policies in economy uh, uh, were not up to the mark and, and they helped uh, lower the purchasing power of many uh, low-income households in rural, uh, in, in cosmopolitan cities like Tehran. So he doesn't have a lot of backing and support among the middle classes. And remember, these middle classes are the ones that usually have the final say in general elections. Mehir Javedan, for how would you judge uh, Ahmadinejad's eight years as president? Um, I think Ahmadinejad is somebody who, uh, whose legacy will be somebody who came from nowhere and decided that he knows best and he decided that he knows better than anybody else when it comes to the economy, to foreign policy and any other area that is the concern of the government. He's somebody who even before he was elected did not like to listen to his advisors and to people and when he came to power he continued and as we see he caused a lot of damage to Iran's foreign policy standing a lot of damage to Iran's economy. I agree with Mr. Gambari that there are people in the countryside who who like what he did because he increased, he, he had the subsidy issue, uh, he also uh, invested in the countryside, he visited places in Iran that many Iranians had not heard of, but uh, nevertheless because of his, uh, his insistence that he, he knows best, he implemented economic policies which at the end of the day I think not only damaged the middle class but also the purchasing power capability of their lower, lower class. And do you, do you think because of his uncompromising stance that that was ultimately his undoing domestically as well because he, he did also have a, a lot of run-ins uh, with, with the, the leadership in Iran uh, inside the country, didn't he? I think that was one of the biggest mistakes he made. President Ahmadinejad did not rise through the ladders of power by, over the years. He was parachuted to the top and he arrived there only because of the support of Ayatollah Khamenei in 2005. Ayatollah Khamenei put him where he was and Ahmadinejad after the, after the 2009 elections he basically lost his head, he, he, he started thinking that he's there because he deserves to be there and he can, and he can even challenge Ayatollah Khamenei and that turned out to be uh, the biggest mistake that he has made domestically. Van Banaderi, it was, it was mentioned in the report there that uh, a lot of people will, will ultimately remember uh, Ahmadinejad for the events of 2009 uh, and the election and, and the, the, uh, the protests uh, of, of the Green Movement. Would you, would you uh, agree with that, that that, that is in, in essence what will, he will be judged for, either rightly or wrongly? Well, what happened during those demonstrations has had nothing to do with President Ahmadinejad. He was just a candidate, a presidential candidate. What happened is that the reformist camp disputed the results of the elections, and, and we saw what happened on the streets of the capital, Tehran, and a couple of other cities uh, across the country. So they were disputing the results of the elections. So I don't think that Ahmadinejad played any part in that. And when you talk about, you know, leader choosing or parachuting a person like Ahmadinejad to power, to become a president, I think it's an insult to the intelligence of the Iranian voters and the Iranian society because here it is democracy and it is the people who decide who should run for president for the next four years. And we saw it a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, they decided to choose reformist uh, president Rouhani for the simple oh, fact that they were not happy second. with the performance hold on, hold of the Hold on a second there, Ghan Barnadere. You, you, you say that the, the people uh, decide this. Is that, that's not entirely true though, is it? Because the, the candidates in this last presidential election as with the previous ones, are uh, ones that are only approved by uh, the supreme leadership. And, and there are other candidates who, who have not met the, the certain criteria and haven't been allowed to, to run for office. So they, 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 I mean, you're right perhaps in saying that the people uh, choose, but it's from a, a list of approved candidates, isn't it? You are absolutely right. We had just a handful of people running for president for the simple fact that we cannot allow, the, the system doesn't allow thousands of candidates to run for president because people will be confused. We have the same kind of you know, mechanism in places like America. We only have two candidates because the system says that at the end of the day, people will be able, it will be easier for them to choose between these two. So if you are disputing the, the mechanism of elections and qualification process, we should also uh, uh, question the uh, 
qualification process in places like America or Europe. So we, we, we have to narrow down the number of people because that's how system works. That's how democracy works. We cannot have so many people. And besides, we don't have so many qualified people for, to run for president. But what about, the, I mean, a lot of people will say that people, it's because the candidates have to be politically vetted by the supreme leadership. That's the real reason uh, uh, why this happens, isn't it? You see, the, the Guardian Council vets the candidates. The Guardian Council, half of it, two, uh, six of it is uh, decided by the parliament, uh, by, by the lawmakers who are elected by the people, and the other six by the leader. And remember, the leader is being elected by the... Uh, by, by, by the, by the Council of Experts. So each one of them directly or indirectly are being chosen and elected by the people. So the whole process is uh, democratic. All right, well, let's, let's, I want to turn back to uh, Meher uh, Javan Danfar on this. And I, I want to ask you as well, from, from the international uh, point of view, presumably a, a lot of uh, people, not, not least Western leaders, will be glad to see the end of uh, Ahmadinejad. What, what, what sort of damage do you think uh, he, he did to, to relations with the West in his, his whole approach, uh, particularly with the uh, uh, talks on uh, Iran's nuclear program. Well, I think it wasn't just his, uh, his, what, his, what he said. I think the fact that he was uh, uh, elected in 2009 by falsification of results. We saw the people who disputed it were jailed. We saw that the Iranian Minister of Interior even said that voting had taken place in Israel, in Jerusalem, something that, is, that would never happen, that there were voting booths here, and people voted for Ahmadinejad and other Iranian uh, electoral uh, uh, candidates. I think this hurt the, the, the position of the Iranian uh, government and the Iranian regime the most. However, afterwards we saw that he denied the Holocaust, something which is actually anti-Semitic, because uh, it's, he's not uh, denying the history of Israel, he's denying something that happened before the State of Israel was even established. And I think this, this hurt the image of the Iranian people abroad. The Iranian people are very tolerant. We have an Iranian Jewish community in Iran, and the people of Iran live very well next to them side by side. And President Ahmadinejad turned out to be the first anti-Semitic uh, president of Iran. And that not only hurt the image of Iran, it hurt the image of uh, of the Iranian people, he also hurt the image of Iran everywhere. We saw that when, when he spoke, the foreign, policy, foreign ministers of the EU walked out. We saw that uh, the country that basically, you know, he went to the United Nations in New York and he said that 9-11 was actually an American plot. And when he said things like that, he did tremendous damage uh, to the standing of the, of the Iranian uh, regime, basically because, again, he thought that he knows better than anyone else and that he knows best what to do when it comes to foreign policy, or as a matter of fact, he, did, he does not have any relevant experience in that field. All right. Well, let's uh, talk then about uh, what we could expect from uh, his, uh, the person that is succeeding him. A wave of optimism has swept Iran since Hassan Rouhani was elected last month, but the challenges ahead are enormous. Among them, the dispute over Iran's nuclear program. Rouhani has struck a conciliatory tone, saying we are ready to show more transparency and increase trust between Iran and other countries. As a result of the standoff, Iran has faced years of international sanctions. Rouhani has been candid about their effect on the economy, saying inflation is the highest in the region and perhaps in the entire world. Iran is also deeply entrenched in the Syrian conflict. Rouhani insists he will continue to support the Syrian government, but he's offered to mediate between President Assad and those in the opposition who strive for democracy. So, uh, Ghan Banadere, if I could turn back to you then. Um, uh, obviously, a lot of economic uh, problems in the country. Uh, that we, It's going to be quite a challenge then for Rouhani to tackle. Yes, uh, during the election campaigns, he promised to fix the economy in within three months or to come up with some kind of uh, you know, road map or plan. Now he has taken back his words and he says that within the next three months, he will come up with a report on the state of the economy. Then he will say what he's going to do with it, which means that uh, he also admitted that the, the situation of the, the economy is, more, is worse than what he had first anticipated, which means that he has a huge task. 
ahead of him. I don't think he can, he can fix the economic issues of the country in, in less than two years or so if he has a solid pro, uh, policy or plan. And, and we have to wait uh, for that to see. We can also at the same time blame the, uh, the, the sanctions regime imposed by the West against Iran over its nuclear program. But remember, most of these problems have come to the fore because of mismanagement of resources. And the, everyone here is blaming the government of Ahmadinejad for that. So we can say that, yes, sanctions had some impact on Iran, but, but, but in worst case scenario, we have to blame the government and its management and, and its mismanagement. Uh, Mihar uh, Javed Danfar, they're already talking uh, in the U.S. about uh, slapping further sanctions, tougher sanctions uh, on Iran. Um, is that the right way uh, forward, do you think? Um, I would say that we should wait. I think they should have waited to see what Mr. Rouhani can do. Um, but I have to be honest, you know, what they passed yesterday was a measure. It's not law yet. It has to be approved by the Senate around September, and then it has to be approved by the president before it becomes law. So if within that time, I think President Rouhani can show concrete steps with regards to Iran's nuclear program, if Iran's nuclear program becomes more transparent under him, Iran starts answering questions to the IAEA that it's not answering, and that uh, you know, Iran starts um, taking a more constructive approach, bilateral talks with the US, then I think it's possible that President Obama may, uh, may actually delay signing such a, such a measure if it's approved by the Senate. And I think such a constructive step, if it comes from President Rouhani, is going to, even if they d impose sanctions, is going to delegitimize them. I think that the, President Rouhani has a lot of um, uh, power and legitimacy to change things. Uh, to be fair, it's not all in his hands. It depends on the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, who is an unelected individual. It's up to him that he has the last word on the nuclear program. But if he allows President Rouhani to take concrete steps forward, I believe that President Rouhani, yes, he does want to make a much more constructive approach when it comes to Iran's relations with the West. Well, it's it, it, one of the reasons why a lot of voices in the United States are talking about slapping uh, further sanctions on Iran, uh, Meher Javadanfar, is because um, they, they believe that uh, uh, Hassan Rouhani's uh, election was a direct result of the sanctions, and they, they see him uh, as this sort of pragmatic and, and, and moderate leader. But does that necessarily mean that he's going to deliver a, a, a better outcome for, for Western interests when we look at Iran's nuclear program? I mean, are they misjudging him here? Well, I think we should... I think we should look for a win-win situation here, one whereby Iran answers all the questions regarding IAEA and Iran um, basically, you know, uh, we, have, we know for 100% they're not making a nuclear weapon and, you know, they can have limited enrichment on Iranian soil and, you know, the rest of the world knows Iran's not making a bomb. Now, the question is, did sanctions lead to President Rouhani being elected? I think President Ahmadinejad's destructive policies, plus the isolation that they produce, plus the massive economic damage that Ahmadinejad's mismanagement and sanctions produced, put all together, created such an economic uh, problem for the supreme leader that he needed to allow Ayatollah, Ro to allow Mr. Rouhani to be elected. I don't think Mr. Rouhani was his candidate. I think Ayatollah, Khamenei was, I, I, Ayatollah Khamenei's ideas were much closer to Mr. Saeed Jalili. But I think, unlike 2009, this time Ayatollah Khamenei allowed the candidate to actually win. And Mr. Rouhani was elected, and his biggest task is going to be to, to sort out the economic problems of Iran, which are, which are very, very large, very challenging. I don't think anybody can expect him to solve them within a year or even two or three years. This is going to take a long time. And through that, it will probably entail improving relations with the West, because without that, it's going to be extremely difficult to improve Iran's economic performance under the current uh, regime of sanctions. Khan Banaderi, how do you see uh, Rouhani approaching uh, things like the, the Iran's uh, nuclear program and, and its dealings uh, with Western nations? 
Well, b before that, I would just make, I would like to make just one thing very clear. The U.S. government, by ratifying another set of sanctions against Iran just three days, think about it, three days before the inauguration of uh, President Rouhani, uh, made it absolutely clear that they are not interested in resolving their disputes with Iran, including the nuclear dispute, through dialogue and diplomacy. Because they are not diplomats. They are just hooligans, and they want to impose their will on others. So they don't have any kind of positive well, no, attitude but the, the point, the point the was made earlier that this was one, this is one house in in Washington. This is the the House of Representatives in Washington. This is not necessarily uh, something that it, that is going to be approved by the U.S. It still has to go through the U.S. Senate. It still has to be signed off by the president. So it's it's far from being uh, a done deal. And and the U.S. House of Representatives doesn't necessarily represent the entire uh, U.S. government, does it? So it, it is. Uh, there's still a long way before we get to that stage. I hope that this is going to be the case. Many people, millions of people here hope that we will normalize, normalize ties with the West. That's why so many people voted for, uh, for Mr. Rouhani. That's why he, came, he took office. So if they want to send the right signal, this is not the, the best way ahead. We need some positive signals from the West because when there is positive signals, Iran, Iranians can also put pressure on the government to tone down its rhetoric and start some kind of constructive dialogue with the West to resolve its nuclear dispute. Remember, believe me, there are many pragmatic politicians here. The leader is pragmatic. He said that he welcomes dialogue with the West. But the thing is that the problem is that he said that I am not optimistic about the results. And uh, he, he has many reasons for that. Think about it. Just three days ago, they ratified another set of sanctions. This is not the right diplomacy or diplomatic approach towards resolving the dispute with Iran. People welcome dialogue with the West. They want to normalize ties. They want to sacrifice, to make some painful sacrifices as long as they can, they can help uh, fix their problems with the West. But they can only do, do that if the West is, is interested and is willing to, to initiate this kind of dialogue. So far, we haven't seen, we haven't heard any positive signal but how much, from the West, how much, especially from the United uh, States. Ranban Adairi, how much is uh, Rahman going to be to be able to uh, maneuver given that the ultimate uh, power in Iran lies with the supreme leader I mean doesn't it ultimately depend on him Yes, of course. The policy of nuclear is being decided on higher levels of the government. And Mr. Rouhani, just as Mr. Ahmadinejad said a couple of days ago, has, has no say in, uh, in, in nuclear talks. But if the West gives some kind of ammunition to Mr. Rouhani and his negotiating team and the government, then he has something to show to the leadership, to, to higher levels of the government. He will say that, listen, this is what the West has done, and we have to do something about it. Otherwise, we are going to be questioned by the people. But so far, we have only seen some dynamites and TNTs at the hands of the government in the form of sanctions and restrictions on Iran and its economy. So Mr. Rouhani doesn't have anything to prove to the leadership and the higher levels of the government that the West is sincere in its you know, approach towards Iran. If he doesn't have that, put yourself in the shoes of the government. How is it? Is he going to convince the, gov the, the, other, the other politicians in the, in the government that there will be some kind of positive results if Iran steps back a little bit or retreats a little bit from its nuclear position? All right, Meher Javad Danfar, if I could turn back to you. What can we expect from uh, uh, Rouhani's policy as closer to home within the, the Middle East region, in particular his dealings with uh, Saudi Arabia and in, with the conflict in Syria? Can we expect much of a change there? Um, I, I think, uh, just if I can just make a small point to what Mr. Ganbari said, I think comparatively speaking in the United States since the Islamic revolution of Iran in 79, no U.S. president has tried as hard as, as uh, President Obama did to reach out to Iran since he came to power in 2008. And, you know, the Iranian government has even refused to hold bilateral talks with him. So I think uh, Mr. Ganbari says that it's the U.S. that it's a hooligan. I'm sorry, the U.S. has wanted to have both bilateral talks with Iran, and Iran is not interested. And the Iranian government, instead of rewarding President Obama for dropping his preconditions of uranium uh, suspension for talks, they actually ratcheted up uranium enrichment and they built four do. So I think, uh, I think, to be fair, I think it's the Iranian government that has not uh, been 
rewarding the moderates in the US. And I think the US should make sure that it doesn't make uh, the same mistake. When it comes to Syria, for Iran, it's a geopolitical interest. For the Iranian regime, it's domestic and it's also geopolitical. So fundamentally, it's not going to change, as you see. wants to have influence in this region. Every country. It's not going to change because Iran needs to have, uh, to have its ally. Syria is the last state ally of Iran in this region. Other allies of Iran are non-state actors such as, such as Hezbollah and, their, and Islamic Jihad. And also the last thing is that if the people of Syria manage to overthrow their government, that may set an example for the people of Iran and the Iranian government doesn't want that. All right, that's going to have to be the last word. Uh, thank you to uh, both of our guests, Khan Barnaderi and Meher Javadan Far. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. We'll be back on Sunday with an all new discussion. I'm Hazem Seeker. Thanks again for watching. Bye for now.